Thank you. Uh, so we have been uh, kind of uh, walking through these first verses just to kind of lay the foundation and the groundwork. And uh, if you might remember, uh, Revelation was not written to us, but it is written for us, right? So it was written to seven churches uh, in uh, what would be modern day Turkey, right? Uh, Asia at the time. Uh, and those seven churches are representative of the whole church, right? There are more than seven churches there, but we have a circular letter. Uh, and part of the message is uh, to the church to be uh, guarding against compromise with the world and becoming complacent in the faith, right? Because there's trial, there's tribulation, uh, and uh, it's in our effort, it's in our best interest to keep faithful and to, and to follow Christ. Uh, we kind of uh, finished last week with the greetings of grace and peace, which was from the Father, the Spirit, and the Son. And uh, the order is uh, kind of different than normal, right? Because uh, he's going to move from his stepfather's son, spirit. Uh, the next few verses are going to help us to get a greater picture of who Jesus is. Uh, but uh, from the greetings, we have references from Exodus 3.14, Zechariah 4, and as well as various passages from Isaiah. Uh, and uh, we kind of talked a little bit about how the seven spirits kind of uh, helps us also see the diversity of God's work in the church and in the world. And that brings us to uh, to the introduction to Jesus. Uh, and uh, the introduction to Jesus is going to draw from Psalm 89. So I thought we would start with, we'll reread uh, Psalm 89, 27 through 37, where the titles kind of allude back to. Uh, and then we'll read our text from Revelation, and we'll pick up with uh, how Jesus is described and introduced to us. Psalm, uh, Psalm 89, 27 through 37. I have it. Someone else. Go ahead. Okay. Right. So, all right, 27 through 39. Through 37. All through 37. Okay. Also, I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My mercy I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall stand firm. <coughs> his seed also I will make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. If his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, if they break my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their, and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness I will not utterly take from him, nor allow my faithfulness to fail. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out, out of my lips. Once I have sworn my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like a moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky. All right. Thank you. Now, if you remember, this context was initially uh, speaking of David, the covenant with David. It's a messianic psalm that they understood would point forward to the son of David who would come and take his throne forever. Uh, so, uh, but we get the, the same description from Revelation uh, that is kind of drawing from Psalm 89. So now we can uh, go and start with Revelation 1, 1 through 8, if somebody wants to read that. Be glad to. <clears throat> this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon come to pass. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. This is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the prophecy, the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and obey what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and was and is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has released us from our sins by his blood, who has made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and was and is to come, the Almighty. All right. Thank you. 
so uh, in verse five, what are the, the descriptive phrases that we get for Jesus? We'll just start with the simple question straight from the text. Faithful witness. Faithful witness. Firstborn. Firstborn of the dead. A ruler of kings of the earth. Uh, any of those sound familiar from Psalm 89? Firstborn. Firstborn. Although it's interesting, Revelation is firstborn from the dead. Is that the same meaning? Uh, so we're going to get in. We're going to get into the the uh, the firstborn, right? As the descriptive okay. phrase, right? Uh, so, so the dead is significant in the fact that he rose from the dead, right? right. So we'll we'll highlight the firstborn. But we see all of the, the ruler of the kings of the earth, the faithful witness, all come from Psalm 89. Now, what will be interesting is, uh, and, and this is not uncommon in the New Testament, it'll take imagery from the Old Testament, and it might give it a little bit of a new application in the new. So it might use the same imagery, it might uh, give it a, a new little twist sometimes in the new. Uh, so when you think about this term faithful witness, let's start with that one. Uh, what's the per why do you think John is describing Jesus as the faithful witness? I can think that maybe because a lot of revelation has some difficult periods that people are going to have to live through. And Jesus also obviously lived through difficult periods, yet he remained faithful through all of his turmoil. And um, he's using Jesus as a, um, a goal for all of us to follow when we have difficulties in our life. We can't control what happens to us always. We can control how faithful we are. Absolutely. So... Jesus is the, the faithful witness par excellence, right? He is the one we are to follow. And, 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 you know, when you're talking to seven churches who are facing persecution and death, right? Because that's going to come up with some of the churches too. Uh, they're following somebody who's been there and done that, yep. right? And his victory over death is the same promise as promised to them. So, so in one instance, we see Jesus is the faithful witness and that he is the perfect witness that we are to follow, Okay. Uh, and, and honestly, I think this is probably the biggest thing in terms of the encouragement, the pastoral encouragement, and so on. He's also the witness to God because there's a Philip that asks him, shows up, show us, show us the Father, and that'll be enough. His answer to that is always, if you've seen the Father, you've seen him. Mm -hmm. He witnesses not only to the fact that there is God, but through his character and through his steadfastness. Uh, witnesses uh, God literally. Absolutely. The spirits. Yes. Yeah. So, so part of what you're saying is, you know, a, a term can have layered meanings. Exactly. Right. And, and part of the reason why John uses uh, symbols and uh, language that draws from the Old Testament is you can have multifaceted meanings attached to it without going into uh, lengthy discourses. And, uh, real quick, we, what was just read, you know, talks about him coming on clouds and the ones that pierced him would see it. And, you know, what does Jesus say, you know, when he's before the Sanhedrin? Um, this is from Matthew 24. Um, then the high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. You have said it yourself, Jesus answered, but I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. That's and that, again, is what Revelation is referencing right there. I think that's Matthew 26, though, isn't it? Um, oh, I'm sorry, what did I say? 24. I'm sorry, because it, uh, it was verse 64, that's what threw me off. No. Matthew 26, correct. But the coming in the... Um, on the clouds of heaven, that's in judgment. Yeah, that's what you're going to see in Revelation. Uh, and and we are going to dive into that. Phrase. Right, right. I don't want yeah. to just. Uh, but, but I just read that where it said even those who pierced him. Yes. So some of those who were at the Sanhedrin, <laughs> this happened, are going to see this. Uh, which is the same thing that uh, John will pull up in in verse seven here, yep. right? Is is uh, even those who pierced him. Uh, so, so you see this faithful witness, both in the aspect of he is the witness that we are to follow. You know, it's, it's kind of a picture of 
you want to follow a leader uh, who is not willing to do what he asks you to do or, or a leader who is willing to do, you know, anything he asks you to do is willing to do it first, right? That's what we see in Jesus. He's witness for our excellence. He's faithful to his testimony to God and revealing the Father uh, all the way through. Now, as you think about the connection to Psalm 89, what was the faithful witness in Psalm 89? Go out on a limb to maybe get an answer on your next question. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I said uh, without on a limb. Yeah, yeah. What's what's given the faithful witness in Psalm? Do you still have it open, Don? I do. Uh, it's the last verse, verse thirty-seven, I believe. He shall be established forever, like the moon, like even like the faithful witness. In, oh, that's. Well, it, it's easy to say that's going to be Christ in the future. Right. The faithful witness is the witness of the moon. Witness. In Psalm 89. My bad. I did read that. Witness. Right. So, so now here's what, but we're looking forward to the son of David who will have an eternal reign. So he's drawing from this image from Psalm 89, but it has a little twist to the faithful witness because we see the unending witness of the moon to the reign of David. Right, so we also have this aspect of not only revealing the Father, but we're getting a glimpse of that which will be unending. Right, which he's drawing from the eighty-nine passage. Well, actually, is that is that is that where it's in their language, and he's not meaning literally, or is he meaning literally there? That must be literally. Uh, literally. Well, like uh, you know, the the moon. We're pretty much. Uh, it's both literal and figurative in the sense. I, I mean, uh, you know, he's given the idea. It's, it's the same sense that the heavens are telling the glory of God, right? Uh, and the, their witness doesn't end. It's just a witness that we see every time we look out at the heavens. And he's using the moon in the same way. He's, he's like saying this this object that is there uh, in perpetuity. I should only use words I can say. <laughs> right? Forever, uh, it's kind of a picture of an unending witness. Jesus is an unending witness, right? Uh, and, and he can be an unending witness. Why? Because he's the firstborn of the dead. And, well, the verse before, <clears throat> his offspring shall endure forever, and his throne before me like the sun. Yeah. Like the moon established forever. What? Where does the moon get its light? From the sun. And, and they yeah. even knew that at this time that uh, the moon essentially reflected sunlight. They weren't exactly <laughs> maybe necessarily sure how, but they knew that that's what happened. And that's the point I find fascinating with this is a, a faithful witness in the sky. Jesus literally reflected the power of God while he was on earth. Yeah. Not only did it indwell him, but he also reflected it because he was a man. Absolutely. So this is kind of like layers that John can do. And, and uh, you know, if you, uh, you guys probably remember Heiser. When Heiser talks about some of these images, he says what Heiser does is he just throws all these Old Testament right. passages in like a blender, right? So he takes all these images and he blends them together to make a, a new composite image or to relay a, a deeper meaning. Uh, so uh, now, in, now we get into the language of firstborn of the dead. Uh, Psalm 89 speaks of making David the firstborn. So here's going to be a question just to get at the at the language, right? Was David, you know, when we think about King David from the Old Testament, the David initially addressed in Psalm 89, was he the firstborn in his family? No. 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 He's the youngest in his family. So how is the term firstborn, when God says, I will make you the firstborn, how has that term firstborn been used? He's being in the line of David. Uh, you know, Israel is described as God's firstborn son. Yep. Yeah. Uh, which is also, uh, right? So we're seeing this term is applied in different contexts, right? Right. I mean, Saul was... Saul was kind of Saul was, he was appointed by I mean God 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 gave concession to yeah. Saul yeah. yeah uh so so I'm not sure we could say first appointed by God but David, in the sense that the God did give uh Saul was selected as well but he was kind of God's 
God's giving into well, he, he human would, characteristics. David yeah. would have been the line of the of the he would have been the firstborn of the original line. The line so he was the, the side original side king, the first king of the original line. Okay. I mean, you can say that about Adam, but uh, Adam being the first well, in a sense. So when you think about the term firstborn, <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, he he was the first. Well, but he was created. Yeah. David's the firstborn of a new paradigm mm -hmm. for the Jewish nation. Mm -hmm. He's uh, been appointed, David. chosen by God. And when and when God does that, what is He given to David? Inheritance. He's giving a privilege and inheritance. Uh, yeah. Uh, does that? Did I hear from the quiet corner yes. over here? Uh, so, so when you think about the term firstborn, you know we we tend to think first and foremost chronologically, but when we think about the term as it's used in Scripture, it's often used to speak of privilege, of status, of preeminence, of uh, one honored above all others. Who received a double portion? The firstborn, right? More of a title. So, it, so it's like a title, right? So when God says to David, I will make you the firstborn, it's not because God is reversing the fact that he had seven brothers older than him or that Saul was the first king. What God is saying is, I'm going to give you privilege and status and preeminence over all other kings, right? Uh, and uh, and through, it, through the line, right? So that's what he's focused on here. Now, when we talk about the firstborn of the dead, Jesus wasn't the first one raised from death. No. no. But he was the first one raised from death to die no more. Resurrected. Exactly. Right. And he's saying there's a privilege, there's a status, there's a preeminence to what we see in the resurrection of Jesus that's unlike anything else they've seen before. That's true, because Lazarus was raised, but he also he then died. Right. Yeah. Lazarus was raised and died again. And, and as I and as I've jokingly said to people at times, I'm like, you know, if anybody had a right to be mad at Jesus, it was Lazarus. Yes. <laughs> right? Well, and, and, uh, to experience the glories of heaven for four days and then to be brought back. Oh, wow. <laughs> All the saints raised at the end of Matthew. Uh, yeah, they, yeah. They mm -hmm. died again. You know. Oh, yeah. 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 Thinking about it, we know for sure he was in heaven for four days. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know where he was for sure. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Lord. I, uh, but that's after. Yeah. But that's after the death and resurrection of yeah. Jesus. Yeah. And there's there's an abode of the righteous dead and the unrighteous dead. Right. Uh yeah. So I mean, you, and, you, and at that point in time, had he and had he confessed Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior? Don't know. He may, he may have after he was brought back to yeah. life again. We certainly know that they were friends with the family. Yeah. And and we can get into, uh, uh, is it Luke 16, when Jesus talks about being in Abraham's bosom and the chasm right. between. Uh, so. Yeah. That's but, the, but, the righteous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It just made me cry. Yeah. Just I, popped it, into my actually, head. Was he there? It, it, is a, <laughs> it is a good thought. Yeah. But, it opens up a whole new can of worms, huh? Then. <laughs> but Lazarus made him take that. You know, if tears could build uh, stairs to heaven, I would go up and bring you back. <laughs> Jesus wept. So Lazarus <laughs> said, you're, you're not putting that by my tomb anymore. <laughs> there you go. As once Jesus weeps again, I'm gone. I'm staying there. <laughs> there you go. So uh, so here in Revelation, we have the term of firstborn from the dead, right? Showing the preeminent privilege status that Jesus has. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, there's another uh First, that's used to speak of Jesus' uh, death and resurrection. We should say uh, resurrection. Uh, anybody know the term from uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 20? Oh, first fruits. Yeah. So the first fruits, right? So we have him here described as the firstborn of the dead. 1 Corinthians lists him as the first fruits, right? Now, what's the significance of that term as we think about Jesus? It also kind of pertains to being firstborn of the dead, why he's got such privilege and status. When was the empty tomb discovered? Well, it was discovered on Sunday. Which was? Connected with? First, first, it was the first. But so they give, the it's first not to do with uh, giving you your first. So, so 
uh, while it connects with the fulfillment of the festival, uh, what's significant is the first fruits were given representative of what is yet to come, right. of like kind, right? So when we look at the resurrection of Jesus, and as he gives, right, the, the faithful witness, the example that we're to follow, we have the assurance through he's the firstborn of the dead, but also the first fruits, meaning that we will be resurrected like him. We'll have a glorious body like his body. Right, so all these things are kind of packed into these few terms. This is why it's taken us so long to get through these first few verses, right? Because there's there's a lot of meat that's packed into the language that John's using uh, that's being conveyed to the readers that we just kind of read over quickly and we we miss the significance. I really feel like an idiot because I really, when you were talking, you were talking about David and yet it talks about Jesus being the firstborn of the dead. Well, first you know, in here, and yet you were talking that David was given all the inheritance and, and he had the privilege and all that. Well, I, w I got somewhere in there really messed up. Oh, well, David, God said to David, I will make you the firstborn. firstborn. What he's saying of Jesus is you're the firstborn of the dead, right? So the language of firstborn comes back uh, so we're looking at what, what that adjective firstborn means. Yeah, yeah. but firstborn is Jesus, right? Because it says, and from Jesus Christ, oh. Firstborn saying, from the dead. Yeah, so, so the firstborn of the dead is David? No, Jesus. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking, but I yeah. don't... Understand but David's story. not the firstborn of the dead. He's just the firstborn. Right. It's a title given to him. Right. So firstborn's the title. In Psalm 89, the title of firstborn, I will make the firstborn a David, right? I'll give David the status of, of, the eldest of, the, son. of the eldest son of the king, right? And the covenants made with David to establish his throne forever. As we come to Jesus and he's drawing that language of firstborn, he attaches another word to it, and that word's dead. Because Jesus is not only the firstborn and the one that, with the status, but he's also the firstborn of the dead. His resurrection was unlike any other resurrection. Yeah, yeah, okay. I mean, technically, he what his raising yes. was a resurrection. His, his, his raising, yeah. There's what David's got to do with the first age child. Does that help or? Yeah. The Old Testament. <laughs> I, I I hear yeah and I hear not so much yeah yeah uh, so but if you if you're thinking about uh, he's showing how Jesus triumphed over death right so when you in addressing these seven churches who are facing persecution and death he's saying look at the the faithful witness who likewise died for his faith but rose firstborn of the dead. Right, he has a, a status and privilege, but the, the promise that's also implied in that is you your faithfulness to him might end up in your death, but it'll end up in your resurrection. Okay, uh, okay, <clears throat> I think that did it. <laughs> so in the in the midst of the persecution, John is wanting them to fix their eyes on Jesus, right? Who now? What's the next title he gives us? Is ruler of the kings of the earth? Yep. Now, if you go back to Psalm 2, you'll notice uh, in Psalm 2, which is also a Messianic psalm, it talks about how kings have set themselves against the Lord's anointed. But if you go on in the psalm, it says they set themselves against the Lord's anointed and the Lord basically laughs at them. Yeah. Right. right? Now, isn't that interesting, right? You can set yourself up against me, uh, but I'm going to be the one to get the last laugh. Uh, so that's from Psalm, psalm 2. Uh, now, as he goes on, uh, he says, to him who loves us. Now, generally speaking, when we when we talk about uh, God's love, we well, God showed us his love in that he you know, gave a son on the cross. And we usually use kind of the past tense as the demonstration of his love. But here he focuses specifically on what Jesus did. He freed us from our sins by his blood, but he uses the present tense to him who loves us. Why? Uh, why do you think he's using the present tense, right? He's not saying to him who loved us and freed us from our sins, but he mixes the tenses. Yeah. 
right now this is this is the stuff that makes you want to pull your hair out i know right but grammar is important and he uses the grammar in the way he does for a reason present tense and loves us past tense freed us by his blood why do you think he's using the present tense he's, he's active he's alive he's not the god of the dead he's the god of the living exactly right he's emphasizing hey he's the firstborn of the dead right he died, but he's dead no more. His love is not confined to what he did to us on the cross. He is presently loving us, the one who sits as the ruler of, king, of the kings in heaven. And when, when it mentions the part about the king, um, the kings as well, go back to Proverbs 21.1. The king's heart is a waterway in the hand of the Lord. He directs it where he pleases. So again, they're ascribing to Jesus what the Old Testament ascribed to Yahweh. Exactly. And it's a, that's the thing that is so mind, not only mind-blowing at this time, but still hard for us to accept today, that when Jesus said something, it's the word of God. Yeah. It's not just a really righteous guy who got a lot of it right. It's the word of God. When, as, as Don does a very good job of pointing out, when when Jesus is hanging on the cross, it's God hanging on the cross. And that's the part that John is really trying to get across in this. Because uh, part of what he's trying to do is get the Christians out of Jerusalem. And in order to trust that exodus, you need to know that this marching order is coming from God. And that's a lot of what he's trying to establish here in the opening. And, and you're very right. It's incredible. Yeah, it, it really is. When we get into some of the later um, symbols and stuff, I don't imagine we'll have to drill in quite as, as much. Uh, but, but he really packs a lot in these terms. And there's a reason why he's using these terms in these echoes. And you can't just blow past it. Exactly. And get to the get to the fun stuff about you know how deep the blood is and all of that stuff. That's important, but this is every bit. Absolutely. Maybe even slightly more important because it's establishing the groundwork from which John's going to tell us everything else. Exactly. Uh, and, and we have to take our time to make sure the foundation yeah. is solid. Because if the foundation is solid, then that will help us down the road, right? Uh, if if we start with a bad foundation, and that's why we want to make sure there's clarity here up front, so that everything will make sense as we as we move forward. Now, when you talk about the language of, of freed by His blood, what does that raise to mind? Because Rich has already given the kind of a term that takes us back to freed from the law. Freed from the law. Okay. So there's a sense, right? There's a captivity that was there, right? To use the language of freed. Uh, freed from death. Freed from death. Okay. So uh, so we have freed from the law, freed from death, what's also connected with the law and death. Sin. Sin. sin freed from sin. And the language of scripture is we were captive to sin and death. Okay. Uh, how, was, uh, how was Israel uh, freed from Egypt? The exodus. The exodus, exodus. Which, which what preceded that? What was the final thing preceded so that? Blood, blood over a doorpost by chance? We had the sacrifice of the Passover lamb and the blood applied to the doorpost. When did Jesus... When was Jesus hung on the cross? During, Seems like it was Passover. I think it was during Passover. Right? So the language also takes us back, right? And, and, and what we're seeing in Revelation is a mirror of the exodus from Egypt. Absolutely. Only now it's a, an exodus from sin and death, yep. right? And it's a coming out of Jerusalem as well, right? But but we have this big picture of he has freed us. He is leading a new exodus. And out of that new exodus, he's going to bring forth a new people, right? So as we come into the, uh, uh, as you think about the old pri uh, the priest, how were they consecrated in the Old Testament? With blood. With blood. And as we think about God consecrating his priest through blood, and as we think about what God's doing with his nation, uh, let's go back and look at uh, Exodus 19, 1 through 6. Okay. 
Anybody have Exodus 19 for us? I've got it. All right. Here in a second. Go ahead. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came out into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagle's wings, and brought you to myself. How far am I going? Ever six. six. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Thank you. Uh, so what was God's purpose for Israel? Be a nation to be his priest. To be his priest. A kingdom of priests. Yeah. Now look at uh, what he's saying here in Revelation. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and what? Made us a kingdom. Priest to his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. And then you get the reference, was it first or second? Second Peter. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, first Peter 2 9. He's okay. made us a holy nation, a kingdom, of, uh, a royal priesthood. Yeah, a royal priesthood. So not only are we going to find in Revelation where he takes imagery that was used of God and ascribes it to Jesus and kind of blends the two. But we're also going to see where he's taking language that was originally applied to Old Testament Israel, and he's applying it. Who is written, Revelation written to? The seven churches. Seven churches. Seven churches. In Asia. In Asia, right? Representative of, of a bunch of, of Gentiles. The Gentiles, right? So he's, he's taking this language that was originally applied to Israel, who did not keep the covenant, right? If you keep my covenant, you know, this was God's purpose to be a, a royal priesthood, a kingdom of priests. And he's now applying it to the church that is composed of believing Jews and Gentiles, right? So we certainly have Gentiles, but look, we also have believing Jews that will be in the mix as well. Right. The, the point is, is there... Especially when this is read. Exactly. The, the, the point is, is these are believers in Jesus who are now composing the true Israel. The true people of God, yeah. And, and who are the people that he has to convince to get out of Jerusalem? The believers. Believing Jews. Jews. That's the thing. That's why he's going so, you could say overboard, but it's not. But why he is working so hard to establish this foundation is you're asking people who were raised to never, ever move from Yahweh. And now you're telling them, by the way, this guy that was hung on a cross and rose three days later, he is Yahweh. Yeah. And so you see why he has to go through this explanation. Because again, it wasn't written to us. Yeah. I'm on board. John, I'm on board. But it was written to a bunch of first century Jews. And this is a great point, right? Because what is John relying right. on? Their Old Testament scriptures. Exactly. They know this stuff. Exactly. Well, that brings up an interesting point, too, is that this is not the first time the nation of Israel had to go through this, where Jerusalem was basically ransacked and destroyed. Yeah. And they oh, didn't believe it. Oh, come on, Don. Name a they, couple of other They times. didn't believe it then. Certainly God's not going to do it twice. Allow it twice. Maybe. Absolutely. <laughs> Right. So now now if, you, if this is the concept that you have trouble with. Right. We're not talking replacement theology. No. There are people who respond to that. We're talking addition theology. Yes. Believing Jews plus now Gentiles who believe. Right. This is not about the church replacing Israel. It's about God's purposes for Israel being fulfilled through Christ, which now includes the nations coming to him. Right. Which is Old Testament. When he says all the nations will come. And we see this in the believing remnant of the Jews and the and the uh, Gentiles who come in faith. This is turning the, the believing Jews into Thomas. Because as soon as Thomas sees Jesus and sees the, the marks, the yeah. first thing out of his pie hole is my Lord and my, my God. God. Yeah. And 
again, it's a, it's a, I like the paradigm shift that Wayne said earlier. This is a paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. The definition. Absolutely. And, and so, and, and we have other texts to talk about this, right? So in Galatians uh, chapter six, verse 16, uh, Paul is talking to the church that's composed of Jews and Gentiles, and he calls them the new Israel of God. Right. Right. So it's not like this is a new concept. It's a biblical concept. If we just don't try to fit into theological systems and allow the scripture to teach us scripture. Exactly. That there's two separate systems. That yeah. will rise out. <laughs> right. That's not true. Now, uh, so because there is a, uh, the futurist system for revelation generally makes two distinct peoples, Israel and the church. Right. And what we see is God takes the two people and makes them one. That's what Ephesians is all about. That's what Romans, uh, uh, Zealotry in Romans 9. There's Romans 2 also. Uh, the true Jew is circumcised of heart in Romans 2. But, but, but we see this principle carries That's the whole out. point of Paul's ministry. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jesus says, I'm going to say to the Gentiles, and by the way, tell him he's going to suffer for me. Absolutely. Because it's not going to be an easy group to win over. So, <laughs> hey, Don, as it turns out, I have that First Peter passage here in my notes. And oh, it's okay. really important, I think, that he's clarifying um, through this, too, that the Jews were the priests. And now the Gentiles and the Jews are the priests. There's this carryover of the priesthood of us having him as our God. Absolutely. Priesthood. He's extending the idea of priesthood. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, at the verse that Don was referencing earlier, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, uh, Peter writes, you are a, uh, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And what we see through the language is he's giving a new status as citizens of his kingdom. And as citizens of his kingdom, we're to reflect his kingdom values, right? So we're to follow the faithful witness. And so as, as he's kind of starting this text, he's, he's pointing out how that same vocation that was originally as, ascribed to Israel, that Israel failed at in the old covenant, is now being applied to this royal and priestly vocation to the church. And, and to the point that Rich was making, he's convincing Jews as well. Exactly. Because what is John doing? He's saying, this is not an abandonment of Old Testament promises. He's saying this is a continuation of what God was doing through the Old Testament. And a fulfillment. And a fulfillment. Uh, you see the promises of Genesis mm -hmm. fulfilled here. But, but so he's, he's picturing the church as a continuation and fulfillment of what the Old Testament was foreshadowing and forecasting. And one of the, in prior study of Revelation, one of the things that has jumped out to me is the bulk of the Bible has been fulfilled. Yeah. And I really think that's one reason there's a move towards the pre-trib and, and making it all future. Because if you say the bulk of the Bible has been fulfilled, then what good is it? Well, it's a lot of good because fulfilled prophecy shows who God is. But the big fulfillment is going to be when he comes from the east and comes to take us home. Yeah. And that's the part that this really helps us to understand the studying this book really helps us to understand is that we are not forgotten. Like the seven churches, we may be persecuted, but we're never forgotten. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we uh an observation. Richard said this is written so the Jews will get out of Jerusalem, because the destruction's coming. Partly, yep. It took the disciples three years of everyday contact with Jesus to figure out who he was. And how much time are we talking about from when this was written till Jerusalem was destroyed? There's big arguments about it. Uh, yeah, so you're probably, you're talking just a few years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for the early dating of Revelation, uh, and, and you're right, there's there's big debate, right? Part of it puts it after the fact, which uh, is a, we have a lot of evidence. Uh, I mean, a very strong argument for an early dating. So you're looking at 
when he says these things will soon take place, you're talking a few years at this point. When was Paul? And, and based on the. I think it was 66, 67. I see you know, uh, how 64 and 68. Thick headed the disciples were. How many people are going to take this to heart? Actually, a lot historically, because if you remember in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus said, when you see these things taking place, flee. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and historically, we know what Christians did was they fled. They went against the grain of everything they've been taught about running to the walled city, and they fled because they're like, hey, you know this Jesus guy? He said, oh. when we see these things, we should flee. And I think we're going to flee. Yeah. Uh, and so we actually have historical evidence for that. Yeah. To be fair to the disciples, they didn't uh, have the understanding of the Spirit until after Bingo. Jesus died. Yeah. To put those pieces together either, where right. all the early believers would have had Spirit to help them. That is because after the fact, you know, believers are coming. There's the giving of the spirit, and absolutely, because that uh, we'll just say the the spirit is a game changer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and, and Wayne, to to your point, um, that I like the point you made as I listened to the classes that I missed. I like the point that you made that this book really shows the influence of the spirit. And its com and its composition almost more than any other book in in scripture, and I also think because of that, the it, it didn't have a lot of time. Yeah, most people think this was probably written about 66, 67 um, A.D., probably around the time Paul and Peter are being martyred. So it carried a lot of weight because not only what happened to them. <clears throat> But the fact that the spirit is so influenced on this, and I think when the true believers read this, it made sense to them. And I, I think that was a it was a very good observation. Yeah. And to your point, Amanda, the, the spirit cannot be underestimated in this yeah. at all. Absolutely. So this is going to bring us to uh, the final piece in these uh, first. Or close to the oh, final that's piece. pretty big talk. What does the language of Jesus coming with the clouds convey to you? Let's start with that. Oh. When you hear judgment, okay, and that's because you've studied, right? <laughs> well, cheat. Yeah, <laughs> you, you cheat. Cheater. How, how dare you study the Word of God to understand the Word of God, right? I'm yeah. guessing for for many of you, at least before we started this, coming with the clouds was always associated with His return. Right, mm -hmm. with the second coming. And, and some will draw that from Acts 1. He'll come back in the same way that he went, right, when he ascends and goes through the clouds. So so for many people, and certainly when you think about the futurist camp, when you think about the left behind, when you think about the popular, you know, the coming with the clouds, they ascribe it only to one thing, and that's his return. So we'll just say the burden is on us to show that that language doesn't isn't limited to his return. Right. So let's look up uh, Daniel 7, 13 and 14. That's Old Testament. That's Old Testament. You sure? <laughs> I've got That's it. why I'm asking, Don. All right. All right. Um, All right. Peggy. 7, 13 and 14. Yeah, Peggy's got it. Go ahead. In my vision at night, I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. Are we right now? Yeah. yeah. Keep going. Yep. yep. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. All right. So he's coming with the clouds. Uh, what direction is he going? Towards the ancient of days. So this is this is an enthronement of the Son of Man, mm -hmm. right? Uh, this is language of the Old Testament, speaking of His enthronement, not His return, right? So, mm -hmm. so right away we have an indicator that coming with the clouds is not limited to His return. Now, what was what Jesus call Himself when He was on Earth? Son of Man. Huh. I wonder if he had a purpose of that. Yeah. 
and, and what John does is he combines this passage from Daniel with a reference from Zechariah 12, 10, uh, which is going to be a passage that talks about uh, looking on him whom they've pierced and mourning him. Now, this is the same thing, and I, I'm just going to give you some information here for time's sake. It's the same thing that Matthew does in 2430, only here John adds, every eye shall see him. Every eye is added not to mean without exception, but to highlight the public nature of the yes. event. Uh, this is, it's what's called prophetic hyperbole, being used in the same way as when the scripture said that all of Judea was coming out to John the Baptist, right? Uh, the language has been used to speak of great multitudes, not everyone without exception. Everybody's watching the Super Bowl. Exactly. We <laughs> use the same language today. Yep. It, it's the use of hyperbole to, to make a point. So Jesus, in his present identification as the Son of Man and the progressive, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is actually from, uh, this is a quote from my commentary on the New Testament, I guess the Old Testament. Uh, Jesus and his present identification as son of man and the progressive nature of the present tense suggest that here the Daniel 7.13 prophecy is seen as beginning in the first century, continuing throughout the church age and culminating at the very end of history. And what you see is, is the judgment that happens in 70 AD will foreshadow or it will become a type for the anti-type of the final judgment and the final day of the Lord when he comes back. Right, so Revelation is talking about things that are soon to take place, just as John tells us it's about, but that will become a type or a symbol or a foreshadowing of what will come play, take place in the second advent when Jesus comes again. This was the final exodus. The final have, exodus is us getting out of here. But do you have exactly. the Isaiah 19 1 passage? Uh, that's actually the next question, Don. Do you have it there? Yeah, I do. So uh, so here's another language yeah, of coming one. with the clouds. Dom's going to read it to us for uh, Isaiah 19.1. So listen, the language that's described with the clouds from Isaiah 19.1. This is going to be different. An oracle against Egypt. Look, the Lord rides on a swift cloud and is coming to Egypt. Egypt's idols will tremble before him, and Egypt's heart will melt within it. All right, so here we have the language of coming with the clouds and and. Uh, I'm just going to look at Rich. Rich, how's it being used? In judgment against Egypt, and Egypt is usually a picture of the world. Right. So, so uh, you'll have like Egypt and, and Babylon would likewise take on that characteristic. Sodom and Gomorrah would take on that characteristic. But we have the language of coming with the clouds being ascribed to a temporal judgment in history. That's two different ones. Right. Uh, now. Uh, so in the context of Isaiah, we see judgment on Egypt. We'll also see this language in Psalm 104, 1 through 4, Jeremiah 4, 13. Malachi uh, 3, 1 through 5 also speaks of his judgment in language of coming, uh, though in that case it doesn't include the clouds part. It just uses the coming and judgment. Uh, Matthew 10, 23 uses that language. Revelation 2, 16 uses that language. Matthew 24, 30 uses that language all of which is using the language of coming with the clouds in the reference to coming in judgment. When Jerusalem was destroyed, is there any extra biblical evidence that clouds were involved in that judgment against the Jews? Are you talking about the writings of Josephus? Maybe. Okay. There, there is actually, yeah, if a historian and R.C. Sproul points it out, yeah. that they actually saw like what looked like an army in the clouds. Uh, yeah, and Josephus, who was a Jewish historian who did not believe in Jesus as the Messiah. Uh, he, didn't believe much of the Jewish he, stuff. Yeah, uh, he, uh, in his writings, he said uh, that this just seems crazy and nobody would believe me if so many hadn't seen it. Yes. Uh, and uh, it it's was almost like every eye. Yeah, it, it, like every eye. Wasn't exactly. there Roman soldiers who witnessed it too? Obviously, that some of that's been. Um, I'm, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure they yeah. did. At least that's what I've heard. So this is uh, uh, this is from the uh, Hank Hanegraaff book, The Apocalypse Code. Even the most basic comparison of Scripture with Scripture reveals that clouds are a common Old Testament symbol that, paint, that pointed to God as the sovereign judge of the nations. Jesus, like the Old Testament prophets, wielded the symbolism of clouds to warn his hearers that as judgment fell on Egypt, so too it would soon befall Jerusalem and its temple. And the destruction of Jerusalem, the court that condemned Jesus to death, would comprehend that Christ was judge over earth and sky. 
uh, which goes back to the passage that Rich shared earlier from Matthew 26, mm -hmm. when Jesus says to the high priest, you'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. They knew exactly what that meant. And when we look at what happened in 70 AD, it was basically the vindication that Jesus was who he said he was. He was who he claimed to be to the court and all the people that pierced him. It's his enthronement. Uh, it verifies his enthronement in heaven. All of this language is kind of building for that picture. Uh, now, uh, oh boy, it's that time already. We're so close. <laughs> Go forward. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, Kenneth Gentry points this out. Uh, we, we already spent a couple of weeks on the Olivet Discourse and highlighted how the first part of Matthew uh, pertains to the judgment of 70 AD, but then you see a transition that happens in like verse 35, 36 to, through chapter 25 that speaks of the second coming, and, and you could see it in the language, right? And the first part, you see all these things will happen within the generation. The second part uses language of delay, delay, a long time. The Son of Man no longer knows, right? Only the Father in heaven. But another point that Gentry points out, and this is, a, and I'll quote this, because it pertains to the coming with the clouds. Uh, he says, and I quote, uh, well, actually, uh, he, he outlines how we could speak of coming spiritually, like a, a, in, in fellowship, we could speak of it in judgment and also as the second coming. And he goes, uh, this is significant and that the disciples' original question regarding his coming uses the word parousia. What will be the sign of your coming? Parousia, Matthew 24, 3. Yet Jesus studiously avoids the term to describe events occurring in, uh, uh, events occurring in the first section, though he does use the word ekrachamanos. I apologize for the saying. Perfect. <laughs> but in English, it's the word coming. Right, English same translation, and the key verse at twenty four thirty. Then the sign of the man, uh, sign of the Son of Man, will appear in the sky, and then will all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming, Urka, Urka, uh, Mimenos, on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. After Matthew twenty four thirty four, though Jesus twice uses parousia of that unpredictable coming in the distant future. So Jesus actually uses a different word for his coming when he's talking about the judgment and the Olivet Discourse and when he's talking about his second coming. Anybody want to guess which word is used in Revelation 1-7? It's the coming that's used in the judgment of the Olivet Discourse. Not I, don't, I can't speak the Greek as well as you can. But. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but in Revelation 7, it uses the same word that he uses in the first part of the Olivet Discourse, not the word that he uses in the second part right. to speak of his return. But that's a, a quote from the Isaiah 19-1 um, passage. Or, well, I guess it's a little bit, well, I guess coming's not. I'm, Right, because you're you're talking Hebrew and Greek and right. right. I'm not I'm not talking about the English translation right. of the word. I'm talking about what we see with the the Greek between the Matthew and the Revelation right. text. So I I know we're, let's let's just write, we have one question left on this section. So we're gonna, but we can do this as long as you guys make sure. Paying us overtime. Yeah, we'll pay you overtime. Oh, good. Alpha and Omega. Uh, why does he use Alpha and Omega to stand for God? Why do you think he's using those terms? What are the terms mean? First and the last. It just reinforces everlasting. It, uh, reinforces everlasting, right? The, the first and last terms of the Greek alphabet. Uh, we're also going to see language of first and last. It emphasizes as everlasting. And, and the point is going to be is he is sovereign overall. Yep. Things might be tough for a while, uh, but he was there before anything else. He'll be there after anything else. Yep. You want to be on his side. He's eternal past and he's eternal future. And he's no. present with us now absolutely it encompasses all of time now as we go through the the chapter he uses alpha and omega here later he's going to use first and last it's going to tie in with isaiah several passages from isaiah as well all, all of this is showing his everlasting nature and what he's using here of god he's going to use in the next section to describe jesus as he kind of blends the two together right so whew, we made it through one through eight you didn't even talk about he, how he uses presence, present first, then past. And so. We did that last week. So we did that last week, Don. <laughs> we did it again. So Don is bearing false witness? Yeah. Uh, well, so, today, no, I'm not. 
Uh, is do we have any do we have any questions where we'd love people befuddled before we close? And if not, we can start next week with carryover questions as well. Start next week and befuddling. There we go. Exactly. <laughs> Just make sure when you get to the Alpha Omega you and do your write up that you mention all that you just said. Yeah. I couldn't write fast enough. Fair, fair point. I'll, I'll put that in the write up. Absolutely. So what's the next section? Yeah, so we'll, 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 uh, we'll start next week with a quick recap and, and we'll put it in the notes, yeah? Yes? Amen. You don't have enough time to make me understand completely, but I think I, I got the gist. Uh, you know what? And honestly, uh, with Revelation, uh, that's the goal is to exactly. get the gist. Because I'll be honest, uh, we won't get everything right. Well, right? experts have been studying this for eons. Yeah, but but if we have the gist, that that's right. that's the main point. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. So what's the next section? Uh, verses nine through twenty. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want to know if it's nine through twenty or yep. yeah, nine, Revelation nine, one. Nine, nine nine through 20. Through 20. Revelation one. I know that. Nine through twenty. I, I did dream of us being out of Revelation one. Did you ask something else, Debbie? Yeah, you will keep uh, uh, sending us answers, won't you, so that we can kind of go back through it. And yeah, what's, it, wor what's it worth to you, Debbie? <laughs> yeah, it's the treasurer here. Yeah, the treasurer is yeah. asking for more cash. Yeah, so <laughs> I'll uh, I'll do the same thing I did last week. I'll I'll type up not obviously the whole discussion, but the highlights, and I'll send that out. Thank you. You're welcome. Last week was the first week you did that. Uh, you yes, pay the pipe. So. Right. Uh, anybody want to close this up with a prayer? Father God, we we thank you. We thank you for the complexity and the subtlety of your word. Because, Father, you are a complex yet subtle God. Father, we thank you for what this word tells us. We thank you for being the Alpha and the Omega. And Father, more than anything else, we thank you for the gift of your son. I ask your spirit upon Dan and his message, upon Amanda and her worship. And Father, I ask your spirit upon Network as we go out this week to reflect your son to the world. And Father, I pray this to your glory in the name above all names, your son, our Savior, Christ Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. All right, good discussion. Sorry that we had to rush with it. There's so much packed into those oh, Thursday verses. Well, when you, when you read the burning yes. bush, and the fact that it starts out with yeah. the angel of the Lord, yeah. Yeah. One of the top of the most. Yeah. Then you see 